Hi everyone, and welcome to Good Gift City Church Online Service. It is really great to see all of us coming together across different time zones and locations to worship the Lord in unity. Let's commit this time to our Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the week that has passed. We come before you today remembering your goodness and promises in our lives. We lift up holy hands and humble our hearts to you today. Take delight in our praises, O Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
our praises and our declarations will bring the light of Christ to our homes, to our families today. Thank you, Lord. My Savior, Redeemer, lift to me from the miry clay. Almighty, forever, I will never be the same as you came near. From the everlasting to the world we live, Father's only Son. You live, you die.
worship team. Now moving on to some announcements. Those who require prayer or ministry, please send us a WhatsApp message at 8014-2599 with your full name and prayer request. Please message us before 5pm and our ministry team will be in touch with you after the service. This week, we are pleased to announce the launch of Whole Life Inventory. Let's have Pastor Nal to share more about this exciting news. Thank you, Tabitha. Hi, everybody. Good to have you online with us again. Uh, today, we are launching our church-wide survey called the Whole Life Inventory in partnership with Focus on the Family Singapore. And as been uh, described earlier, this is a survey for us to find out how individuals, couples and families in our church are doing in terms of discipleship and following Jesus. And I believe that this inventory will enable us to better understand the needs of our church and then going forward, how we can further effectively shepherd our people. As long as you are 13 years old this year, uh, and attend our church either online or, or, or physically, uh, you can participate in this inventory. It takes about 15 minutes to complete. Now the inventory is anonymous and confidential. You don't have to put your name down. So we want you to be honest as you answer the questions uh, in the survey. No personal names are required. And it's important that uh, you participate for us to have an accurate picture of the health of our church as a family. So I'm very excited to launch this and it will be up for three weeks for you to respond to, so you have plenty of time, okay? It takes only about 15 minutes. So to do the survey, either use the link you see on the screen right now or scan the QR code. And then you'll be taken to this website, as you can see on the screen, 
then you key in the access code, which is GGC. GGC is the access code. Good Gifts Church, if you like. Now, note that the access code is case sensitive, so make sure it's all in uppercase. Okay, so I would like everyone uh, who would, would like to be part of our church to fill in, whether you are overseas, whether you are here, uh, just complete that survey so that we can have an accurate picture of where we are as a church family. Now back to Tabitha. Thank you, Pastor. This week, we have Pastor Benny Ho bring us the Word of God. Many of us already know him from the many times he shared the Word at Good Gift City Church. But for those who don't, Pastor Benny is the Senior Pastor of Faith Community Church in Perth, Australia. Passionate about expository preaching, he has a life goal of preaching through every book of the Bible. And today, I am glad to say, it's another opportunity to get closer to that target. But before we welcome him, let's prepare our hearts with this song.
Good morning, Good Gifts Church, and thank you so much for the joy and the privilege of sharing God's Word with you this morning. Thank you, Pastor Derek Hong, for entrusting your congregation uh, to me and allowing me to speak to them. And this morning, I want to share with you something which I've entitled Cultural Narratives Today. And it's taken from Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 1 to verse 3. So let's read the scriptures for today. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing and perfect will. Let's bow and we have a word of prayer. Father, I pray this morning that you will open our eyes to behold the truth of your word. I pray that you give us a word in season, a word that will help us to recognize what is going on in our society and how it impacts our discipleship. And then God, turn our eyes once again to behold the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ and to recognize that the gospel is the answer to all of our inner longings and desires. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Today, I believe that we are all engaged in a massive culture war that is capturing the hearts and minds of our society. It is an ideological war that is deep and wide in its impact. And as we seek to disciple our people in the ways of God, we must also know what are the opposing forces and worldviews and narratives that are hindering discipleship today. For those of us who may not be familiar with this lingo of, uh, of a narrative, then we need to ask ourselves, what is a narrative? And I think a narrative is a story on an account, or an account of events that are intended to support a particular viewpoint. And Tim Keller talks about four narratives that actually dominates our culture today. And if we understand what are the prevailing narratives that are in our society, then we are able to address it in the light of the gospel. And these are the four cultural narratives that are uh, dominating our culture today. Let me outline them for you. The first is what we call the identity narrative. And the tagline is basically this, you've got to be true to yourself. Now, this narrative states that we must be true to our inner identity. Now, how do one discover their inner identity? The, the way to discover the identity is to find out what is our deepest longings, our deepest desires and passions. And it is through our self-discovery that we will discover our true identity. And then that is the real me. Now, this is the essence of the identity narrative. And our social media, our entertainment world, Hollywood, etc., has been propagating this identity narrative for a long time. Now, we may not even be aware of it. For example, you take that famous movie Ratatouille. It's a, it tells a story of a rat called Remy, right, who wanted to be a chef. But we all know that that's not what rats do. But what does it matter? Remy's deepest desires and longing is to be a chef. And so he did it against all odds. And as a result, he found his own destiny and a hero is born. Now, that in, is what the identity narrative is all about. Now, the irony of this narrative is that it is really rooted in Christianity. Why do I say that? In the pre-Christian era, our emotions, feelings, longings, desires, they are all things to be overcome rather than to embrace. But Christianity taught us that our emotions, passions, and desires, they can be God-given. And if it is it's part of the image of God in us, once it is properly understood and directed biblically, it can point us to our God-given destiny. Now, unfortunately, post-Christian, we bring this truth to an extreme. And now we say we find our identity apart from God. And we make it all about ourselves. So now, if I feel that my deepest longing is to be Mary and not Benny, if I feel that in my innermost being, I'm, I'm actually a woman rather than a man, then I can become a woman. 
Why? Because I need to be true to myself. Even if I, if, if, if I feel that I should be a dog, I can choose to put on a dog collar, go on all fours and bark like a dog. And no one can tell me otherwise. Why? Because I'm being true to myself. But the problem is that our desires are often not just from within, but it can be a reflection of our culture. You see, our desires can often be influenced by our upbringing, prevailing culture, social media, etc. And what if, brothers and sisters, those influences are not biblically aligned? And another problem is that sometimes our desires are not always reachable. Like, I may desire to sing, but I'm tone deaf. Or I, I, I may desire to be a doctor, but I'm afraid of blood. Uh, I desire to be a world-class football player, but I've got no ball sense, you see. And here's the thing. If our identity is purely based on pursuing our dreams, our desires, our passion, it can be very stressful and it can sometimes turn out to be disappointing. Now, if my identity is rooted in just my desires, my longings, or my race, or my net, my, my net worth, or my ethnicity, or my gender, then it is no longer rooted in the gospel narrative. The gospel narrative tells us that our identity is not rooted in our desires or our longings, but it is rooted in this, that you and I are loved by God. We are created in the image of God, and therefore, we have inherent value that I am more loved, I am more accepted than I can ever hope for. The key question is not who I am, but the key question is whose I am. My identity is found not in my longings, but it is found in my belonging. And I belong to Jesus Christ. You belong to Jesus Christ. We have been purchased by the blood of the Lamb and we have inherent value simply because we are loved by God. And my worth is really based on this. My identity is found first and foremost in Christ. The Apostle Paul informs us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20 to 24. Listen to this. That, however, is not the way of life you learn when you heard about Christ and were taught in Him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught in regards to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your mind and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You see, before we come to Christ, we all live for ourselves. We pursue our own longings and desires. But now that we know Him, now that we have heard of Him and are taught in Him, you and I have a new purpose in Christ, which is to live in Him and to live for Him. This, brothers and sisters, is our true identity. That's the identity narrative. The second narrative that is prevalent in our culture today is the freedom narrative. And basically it says, I should be free to do what I want as long as I'm not harming others. There are many in our society today that believe that our freedom is slowly being eroded. And therefore, we need to stand and fight for it. So, if something is mandated and I don't like it, I'm not going to do it. Why? Because my choice is what matters. The issue can be vaccination or abortion. If you tell me what I can and cannot do, you are violating my freedom and I will not stand for it. And this happens when we are pursuing a freedom apart from God. Now, if we really ask the question, what actually is freedom? The world would describe freedom as the right to think or to do or to believe what one wants without hindrance. But if we just want to do what we want to do, the truth is we are not really free, especially from our own selfish desires. We are not really free. We are actually slaves to our own desires. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 to 16, the Apostle Paul says this, You, my brothers and sisters, are called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. 
rather serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbour as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk in the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Again, this narrative is really rooted in Christianity because it is true that all men are born equal and everyone has the same potential in life. But the thing is this, the gospel narrative tells us that we are born equal. That's true. But we are all born in sin. The truth is there is no good thing in us and we deserve nothing. But Jesus came and did everything so that man can now be restored, spirit, soul and body. And now we are truly free. He whom the Son set free, then we are truly free free. There is no freedom apart from Christ. That's the freedom narrative. The third is the happiness narrative. And it goes like this, I have every right to be happy. The happiness narrative has become a dominant narrative to the extent, I don't know if you are aware, that there are university courses that are dedicated to the study of happiness. Jennifer Eckhart, who is a sociologist, has studied the idea of happiness and she concluded that many choices that people make are really rooted in the pursuit of happiness. But before we are too quick to conclude that society's concept of happiness is totally superficial and it's only focused on things external like wealth, status, success, etc., I want you to know that that is not true. The happiness narrative is a bit more substantial than that. Uh, Christopher Peterson, the professor of psychology at the University of Michigan, talks about happiness as a pursuit of things that makes life worth living. And this includes the use of our talents and abilities to contribute to something greater than oneself. It is about the sense of purpose and legacy that leads to a life well live. So you can see now that the secular narrative of happiness is a bit more nuanced than just becoming healthy and wealthy. Now again, what is missing is that God is removed from the equation and happiness is now rooted solely in man's pursuit. Anything that I feel unhappy about, anything that does not sit well with me, I will reject. Therefore, if ending my marriage will make me happy, then why not? If I could make another million dollars and cheat a little bit and make it, why not? It makes me happy. Now, here's where the problem is. People think that we can find true happiness if only we can get that dream job, that amazing marriage or that holiday of a lifetime. But when we actually have them, we find that it does not truly satisfy. Now, I'm not talking about you having a bad job or a bad marriage or a lousy holiday. Now, they could all be great, but it still does not truly satisfy deep inside. Somehow deep within, there is still an emptiness and we are on this ongoing pursuit for a happiness that refuses to materialize, you see. And then what can we do? People end up, thinking that we either can get a better job or a better wife or go for another holiday and see if it satisfies. And another, another way is to become so frustrated in that pursuit that we just decide that there is no such thing as lasting happiness. And then we just come to that conclusion that happiness is an illusion. But that is going to make us detach and it can dehumanize us. Or we can conclude that if it is a desire that cannot be satisfied by anything in this world, then perhaps you can only find that happiness in another world. I like the way that C.S. Lewis puts it. C.S. Lewis says, If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. 
I like that. And it's true. If, if I find in myself a desire that cannot be satisfied in this world, the most likely explanation is I was made for another world. And if the answer is not in this earthly realm, then it can only be found in the realm of the divine. And that's the truth. True happiness can only be found in God. True happiness is rooted in God. If we pursue God and what He has to offer, not just in this life but even beyond, I think we will find true satisfaction. So here's the saying, happiness is not found by pursuing it. It is the byproduct of pursuing God. And when God is in the center of our pursuit for happiness, we will begin to find true happiness. And this is why the Bible don't really shy away from presenting happiness as a valid pursuit. For example, Jesus, when he preached the Beatitude, he used the word blessed all the time, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit. And that's the Greek word makaros, which actually literally means happy. So we can translate it as happy are the poor in spirit. Or, or when the psalmist in Psalms 1 declares this, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. He's literally saying, happy is the man who walks in the ways of God. Or listen to what the psalmist says in Psalm 16, verse 11. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So you can see that God encourages us to pursue happiness, joy, and pleasures, but it must be centered on Him. And we will find joy by embracing His view for our life and being thankful for what He has done, what He is doing, and what He will continue to do in us and for us. Okay, so that's the happiness narrative. Again, it's the gospel that answers to that longing. Here's the fourth one, morality narrative. No one has the right to tell anyone what is right or wrong for him or her. That's the mantra. In other words, we define our own sense of morality. Now, what is wrong to you may not be wrong to me. You know, what is wrong to you may be right to me. And no one can tell me otherwise. That's the morality narrative. What is right and wrong is for me to define and no one else. And therefore, there is no moral lawgiver. And that's where the problem is. If there is no moral lawgiver, then there are no moral absolutes, right? How then do you tell someone that what he's doing is wrong when he thinks that what he's doing is right? So who decides if it is right or wrong if there is no moral lawgiver? Culture? You know, in some cultures, they love their neighbours, but in some, they eat them, you know? So if there is no moral lawgiver, then there is no moral compass. If there is no moral compass, then there is no moral absolutes. But the prevailing narrative is that no one can tell me what is right and what is wrong. So... Once we think this way, then society can collapse. You know, what was once rejected will soon become tolerated. And then slowly you'll be accepted. And then before you know it, you'll be celebrated. And then it becomes something that is expected. And a new social construct has come about. See, what is once rejected will become tolerated and then accepted and then celebrated and then it's expected. Morality without a moral lawgiver, I tell you, brothers and sisters, is morally corrupt. And that's the problem with the moral narrative. We need a moral lawgiver. And Jesus, God alone, is the moral lawgiver. He determines the absolutes. Remember the story of the rich young ruler in Luke chapter 18? who came to Jesus one day and asked this poignant question, what must I do in order to inherit eternal life? How many of you know that is a giveaway question? It's a question that reveals where this young man's heart 
really is. Notice what he's asking. He says, what must I do in order to inherit eternal life? What must I do? His focus was on his own abilities, his own merits, his own self-effort. That's what's wrong with this whole thing. Self-sufficiency. And that's the problem with the moral, morality narrative. He is seeking to make it on his own steam, but we can never make it. And that is why, brothers and sisters, we need the gospel narrative. The gospel narrative tells us that there is a creator God who made man, male and female, he created them. And this creator God owns us. We all belong to him and we are accountable to him. God gave us laws that defines what is right and what is wrong. And we now have a moral compass based on who God is and what God says. And when we break those laws, we know that we are sinners, we are lawbreakers. And that's how we know that we need a saviour. We suddenly discover that even though God defines all the moral absolutes, you and I can never live up to it. And that's why we need a saviour. And that's why Jesus came. And the good news is this. If we receive him as saviour today, we need not face him as judge when he returns again. And this is the true morality narrative. So we have these four prevalent narrative in our culture today. The identity narrative, the freedom narrative, the happiness narrative, and the morality narrative. How should we respond to them? I think the critical error in all of these narratives is that they put man as the center of gravity rather than God. Biblical discipleship is counter-cultural. It is distinctly different from this self-absorbed, self-conscious, self-centered, humanistic philosophies. And we must do what Jesus did in the Sermon on the Mount. You know, you read the Sermon on the Mount, you see one phrase that keeps coming up throughout the whole sermon. Jesus keeps saying this, you have heard it said. That's the cultural view. But I tell you, that's the biblical view. So you notice that we need to contrast what the cultural leaders are saying with what Jesus said. You have heard it said in the social media, in Hollywood, but I tell you, this is what the Bible says. So we are contrasting what our cultural leaders are saying with what Jesus said. The search for identity, the longing to be free, the pursuit of happiness and joy, the need for morality, meaning and impact. I believe that these longings are all God-given and the gospel actually answers to all these longings. Now, let me explain why. The gospel narrative answers all these longings of the human heart. Now, you may ask, what does that look like? I'll give you an example. On the cross 2,000 years ago, we see Jesus bloodied, bruised, and bitten hanging on the cross. But if you remember, there were two thieves hanging beside him, one on his left and one on his right. One of them turned to Jesus and said to Jesus, Remember me, when you come into your kingdom. And what did Jesus say to him? Jesus said, consider it done, my friend. Today, you will be with me in paradise. And incredibly, this criminal became the first citizen of heaven. And I want you to understand this. The gospel narrative actually answers his longing for the same things. What are these longings? Number one, his longing for identity. How many of you agree that this thief on the cross has a dismal identity? He's a criminal. He's useless. He's disadvantaged and marginalized. He has no hope or future. All of his dreams and desires are demolished. But in Christ, he found inherent value. He discovered that he has intrinsic worth. In fact, he discovered a new identity as a son of the Most High God. And Jesus said to him, Today, you'll be with me in paradise. And he became the first citizen of heaven. The gospel answers his longing for identity. Here's number two. 
the gospel answers his longing for freedom. On that cross, the thief has lost all freedom. Is that right? He, is, he can't even be free to scratch his own face. He was totally restricted and restrained. And he recognized Jesus to be God. And then he said to the other prisoner, don't you fear God? Remember that? He found his freedom to surrender to God and to say to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And that day, I want you to know, he was truly set free because he whom the Son set free, he is free indeed. The gospel answers not only his identity and his longing for freedom, but it's his longing for happiness. To the thief dying on the cross comes this most joyful words when Jesus said, Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Brothers and sisters, that is true happiness. Can you imagine what it was like for this thief when he closed his eyes in death and then he opened it to find himself standing in heaven? He opened it just to step into the portals of heaven. He walked the streets of gold right into the presence of Almighty God. And in His presence is fullness of joy. At His right hand are pleasures forevermore. The gospel answers His longing for happiness. And finally, the gospel answers His longing for morality. Listen to this. Don't miss this. This immoral thief on the cross found true morality, not by trying to do good, but in recognizing that he was a sinner. And he turned to the other thief, in fact, and said to him, If we are punished, we are punished justly, for we are getting what we deserve. But this man, referring to Jesus, has done nothing wrong. You know what this thief was doing? He was acknowledging that he is a sinner deserving of nothing but death, but only God alone is good. And brothers and sisters, that is the starting point of true morality. For that thief on the cross, all four cultural narratives find convergence in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that in Christ, all of our longings are fulfilled. Outside of Christ, everything is hollow and deceptive. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, the Apostle Paul wrote this, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather than on Christ. Brothers and sisters, our hope, our longings, our desires can ultimately only be fulfilled in Christ. This is the gospel narrative. And Jesus alone will answer to our longing for identity, freedom, happiness, and morality. Brothers and sisters, if you are listening to me and you are not yet a believer, I want you to know this, that you are, as you search you know, for the meaning of life, as you search for, for a sense of impact and, and purpose in life, I want you to know that it is the gospel that will be able to bring you into your true identity, your true freedom, true happiness, and true morality. It is not about us. It's all about Him. There is no identity. There is no freedom, happiness, or morality outside of God. May we put God back into the center and let Him be the center of gravity rather than ourselves. Would you bow and let's pray together. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you open our eyes to recognize what is going on in our world today. God, I pray that you help us to see once again that it is your gospel that will answer man's longings for identity, for freedom, for happiness, and for morality. And today we turn to you. We put you back in the center of our life. May you be the center of it all. Thank you, Lord. And in you, we find 
our longings and desires fulfilled. Our longings for identity. I'm a child of the living God. I am free because Christ has set me free. And he whom the Son set free, we are free indeed. In you we find our joy because you at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And in you we find our true morality because there is no moral uprightness apart from you. So thank you, Lord, for all this. Thank you for being our God, our King, our Saviour. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We bow our hearts. We bow our hearts. We bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. Oh, Lord, we cast down our idols. So give us clean hands, give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Oh God, let us be. A generation that seeks, seeks your face, O oh God of Jacob. O oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, seeks your face, O oh God of Jacob. We bow our hearts. We bow our hearts. Bend our knees, O oh Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things, O oh Lord, we cast down our idols. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts. Not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Oh God, let us be a generation that sees who sees your face. Oh God of Jacob, oh God, let us be a generation that sees, sees your face. Oh God of Jacob, sees your face. Oh God of Jacob, who oh sees your face. Oh God of Jacob. Pastor Benny for the message. Which of the four narratives spoke to you? Let us allow the Holy Spirit to use this message to do a deeper work in our lives. We have now come to the end of the online service. Thank you for joining us and we hope to see you again. Have a blessed week ahead. The Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face to shine upon you the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and be gracious unto you Lord lift up His 
Yeah. 